to save your soul from death But it's all works righteousness, you know Can I manufacture grace for self-denial in some religious place By weeping hard on your face and saying prayers to some dead saints, you know it's a little cheese, self-flagellation till you bleed. A secret vows that you can't keep. Mysteries and visions when you dream. It's a narrow way that you must come through the Father, through the Son. Loving Him more than other loves. Family, friends, yourself, and a one. By grace alone. Faith alone on the way alone because of Christ alone. He is our only hope. He is the cornerstone. Good to be with you again and welcome to the program. Today I'm happy to introduce to you. Tony DeLego. Welcome to the program, Tony. Thank you. And uh, interesting because Tony has a Polish background and some Italian thrown in, but <laughs> principally Polish. And uh, I am interested because Poland is very similar to Ireland, where I grew up, uh, very traditionally Catholic, and they really understand Catholicism and really live Catholicism and a lot more pomp and grandeur than even the ordinary Catholic Church is seen in Poland. I've seen it in my own eyes in Warsaw, and um, I am really encouraged to know that you were a former uh, Polish Catholic, Tony. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about growing up in a home where Polish was spoken and what it was like with your you know, Polish-speaking mother and what Catholicism was like as a young boy. Sure. Um, <clears throat> my uh, my grandmother, uh, my great-grandmother, who, who died when she was 97, I believe, only spoke Polish. Uh, she came over when she was 14, as my mother puts it on the banana boat. And uh, um, my grandmother, who died not too long ago, spoke Polish and English. And she would translate for us as we... Uh, I remember visiting my great grandmother in the the uh, old folks' home, I guess, or uh, that they called it back then. And uh, she would be praying the rosary, and she had a picture uh, on the wall that she called Borja, or in Polish for for God and Jesus. And uh, yeah, we would always go visit her, and my grandmother would translate for us. And you know, rides in the car, I'd be little guy sitting in the middle of grandma and uh, my mother. And they would be speaking Polish back and forth, and, and I'd catch every other word. Uh, and then uh, my mother, you know, primarily spoke English to us, but uh, you know, she was raised uh, in the same Catholic um, background, Catholic Church, Polish-speaking uh, church. Uh, high Mass uh, at eleven o'clock on Sundays was in Polish as well, and uh, so they would constantly speak Polish around the house and, and try and teach me words. Uh, in that, and to the point of, uh, you know, when when I went to school, I went to a Catholic school, and it was also Polish, uh, and they would they had a class in Polish, so they would teach you Polish then as well. Did you have any uh, prayers at home, like the Rosary or anything? Did you pray that or anything like you any yeah home, uh, Catholic? Uh -huh. like the devotionals. Uh, we never did much devotion as a family. It was more of a surface Catholic. You know, we Catholic in name, go to church on Sunday, um, do the, the penances as they came up on religious holidays, uh, things of that nature. But we, we did learn the, um, the Our Father and the Hail Mary in Polish. I uh, couldn't remember them today, though. Uh, I suppose if, uh, if if you could get me started in Polish, if you remember it, <laughs> I might be able to remember it, but uh, I don't remember it uh, as far as that goes. We would also sing Polish Christmas carols uh, at home, sometimes around Christmas. And, uh, you know, around the piano, we'd get together and sing them in Polish. And my grandmother would sing Polish to us, and, and she'd pray some in Polish once in a while with my, my great-grandmother, who would, as I said, sat there in the... Uh, 
in the home and, and did the rosary constantly. Um, and stared out the window and just said the rosary, all in Polish, of course. Yes, and uh, when you went to church then, did you become an altar boy or did you get involved in the church life? Or mm -hmm. what was it like as a young boy in a Catholic church? Uh, it was expected that you would be an altar boy. There was uh, several several people that we knew that went to church there. And when uh, I, I remember when their their sons didn't weren't altar boys, it was a big you know scuttlebutt. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of talking, a lot of whispering. You know, how come he's not an altar boy? And you know, following you know what you're supposed to do with godparents and, and things of that nature. Um, we, although I went to a public school. Um, to third grade, from fourth grade to eighth grade, I went to the Catholic school, St. Stanislaus Kuska uh, Catholic Church and, and Catholic school, uh, run a bunch of nuns and uh, a couple of lay teachers. And uh, as I said, one of the things that was expected as you went to the school was to be an altar boy. And so from fourth grade to eighth grade, uh, I was an altar boy in the Catholic Church. What was it like to serve the priests, and what were the priests like? You know what I mean to say mass for, like what they, you know, how did they speak to you? What was their attitude to you? And you know, uh, did they in any way were they an example to you, or were they, you know, what, what just was your general impression as a young boy of the priests that you dealt with? Oh, uh, that's a. That's a loaded question to answer, I guess, because um, several times as, as I was growing up, I, re I remember things that I was told by nuns about the priests. I was told by the priests in our, you know, they had religion class uh, where they told you about the, the priesthood and, and various things in, in Catholicism. In fact, I, I had at home, uh, my mother just recently sent me my first communion little uh Folder. It gives you tell. There's no Bible verses in there. There's nothing about Christ. It's all about here's your communion, and this is what you'll say when you go through communion the first time. And you know, and there was a rosary that came with it, and it came in a little folding uh, um, uh, leather thing, along with the scapular that uh, we were told also by the nuns that uh, if you wore the scapular or a similar cross every day of your life on the first Saturday after you die, Mary will come to. Uh, What's the interim between hell and purgatory. purgatory? Mary will come to purgatory and get you out. So if, as long as you wore that every single day of your life, uh, she'd come and get you out the first Saturday after you died. Um, so it, for a while I wore it, you know. Uh, but I remember the priests in particular were held up by family members, by adults, as being better than anyone else. Uh, they were more important than anyone else. They were held to a higher esteem higher value than anyone else. Um, we were told, you know, to honor, respect, uh, follow whatever direction they gave you, do whatever they tell you to do because they're one step away from God and their God manifest today on planet Earth for you. And I remember, you know, some of the, the priests uh, talking about confession and one of the first times that we went to confession and, and talking to the nun who was bringing us to church saying uh, that I won't give them too many, too many penances to say maybe a couple Hail Marys and a couple of our fathers. And I remember thinking what we were explained about confession was you confessed your sins to the priest so the priest can absolve your sins and then you had to do penance and your penance was based on what your sin was. So if you had a lot of sin, you did a lot of penance. If you had a little bit of sin, you did a little bit of penance. But here he is stating that he's only going to give us a couple of things to say because he didn't want to make it too complicated. And I thought I didn't, really didn't understand that because it didn't go with what we were taught. And uh, so some other times when uh, when I would see the priest, uh, the, the the head priest at our at our church, the parish priest, the, the parish, parish priest, a pastor, yeah. Um, I remember him uh, smoking a, a pipe, rocking back and forth on, on uh, the front porch of the big ornate uh, place where he lived. Uh, and he also had a camp. Found out about that a little while later. A big fancy camp. It was called a retreat for him, though. It was his retreat, but it was a big fancy camp. It apparently cost a lot of money. And uh, the big ornate church that we had, and 
you know, he would be rocking on his front porch, you know, smoking a, a pipe, and that I was being lectured not to smoke because it was bad for me, and I couldn't understand that. If he was supposed to be an example, why was he smoking? Uh, and then uh, several times where I, I thought that, uh, you know, the, the priest was intoxicated. Of course, I'm a little guy. I don't know, you know, what I'm talking about as, as a little person, especially, you know, that age. But I remember serving the... The, the wine and the water and they wash their hands before they do the Eucharist uh, with the water and then pour the wine and, and we did uh, a whole week you were on call as an altar boy to do a week's worth of service in the morning where you do several uh, masses and it was one after another and, and boy, we went through a lot of wine you know and you know, we were told that the wine turns to to blood uh, when, when the priest uh, raises the chalice up and it didn't look like blood to me. It looked like wine <laughs> mixed with some water. But, uh, yeah, there, it just seemed to be a different standard. They were held to a different standard and held to be better than anyone else and that we weren't as good as they were, yet they did and acted the same as anybody else in the world, as far as I could tell. Yes, when you went to your first communion, when you were introduced to go to communion, uh, what was that experience? Did you... Um, did you really think that you were receiving the body and blood of Christ? And was it explained to you so that you knew this really is the blood of Christ, this really is the body of Christ, and what it looks like bread and looks like wine, it really is the body and the blood. Was that explained to you and how was it, you know, who instructed you, mm -hmm. how, did, how did all that come about? Uh, primarily it was the nuns. Um, and you were brought in um, second grade, I believe it was, was when you did your first communion. And you were brought in, and it was a big deal. You know, you had to wear appropriate dress. And, you know, you'd, the big deal for me was the party afterwards because you got a lot of money, and I bought my first bicycle with all the first communion money that I got. And I remember it cost $75. Don't ask me why I remember that, but I do. And it was all money that I got for my first communion. But uh, you, you were told that it was the, the body of Christ. We weren't given any blood of Christ. Um, if if it was truly wine turned into blood, then why wasn't it part of the the first communion? In our case it wasn't. We were just given it and we were told not to chew the wafer because you're chewing the body of Christ. Okay, once again it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. You know, take this wafer and don't chew it. Just let it dissolve in your mouth and you know, so on and so on. And I, I didn't understand it. Quite frankly I really didn't know or care. Uh, I was just told, do what you're told. Do what the priest tells you. Follow the nun's direction as they lead you around and, and give you instruction and just do what you're told because everybody does it. It's okay. And I just obeyed my parents. So did, their did you then continue to go to Mass every single Sunday? Did you go to confession on Saturdays? Or what was the <laughs> procedure? Oddly enough, never went to uh, confession all that often even though we were taught that in order to receive communion on Sunday, you needed to go to confession prior to that because you had to get rid of all the sin you, you built up during the week, do your penance, get rid of it so you can accept the body of Christ. Otherwise, you, you, know, you weren't supposed to take communion. Well, we'd take communion anyway and not go to confession. I can't remember a time where my parents went to confession once. And I remember my mother saying that uh, my grandmother uh, received uh, communion when she was ill in the hospital. You know, well, Father so-and-so came and gave her last rites and gave her communion and, and so on. And Or that she took her to Mass because she hadn't been in a long time and she went, you know, I walked her up to communion and I said, well, you're not supposed to receive communion unless you've confessed your sins. Then my mother told me, well, your grandmother's really old so old people don't sin. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. And this had been when I was an adult and I said <laughs> Ma I tried to explain to her I said that doesn't make any sense and that, that's primarily where I keep getting in trouble because I questioned the Catholic Church and I questioned what they told me and I questioned the tradition and, and I just didn't agree with a lot of it because it didn't make any sense um, we were never taught the Bible never once were we handed a Bible there was a Bible in my house but I was taught that you didn't touch it and it sat in the corner in a cedar box and, you know, if it fell on the floor, you were supposed to pick it up and kiss it. You know, you weren't supposed to play with it. You weren't supposed to read it. Can't write in the pages. Well, how are you supposed to study God's Word? How are you supposed to be Berean if you don't do those things? So it was, it was very difficult for me to accept. I just followed direction. I did what I was told. Yeah. You spoke earlier on about the ornate 
way in which the church was uh, mm -hmm. decorated. Uh, <coughs> I remember myself from being in Warsaw in 2003 mm -hmm. how ornate the Catholic churches were. Now I've seen ornate churches in Italy and in my own Ireland and in other Catholic countries but I was still amazed by the Polish uh, mm -hmm. Catholicism. Mm -hmm. and so could you give us some explanation of what it was like to go inside uh, the Polish type of mm -hmm. uh, church? Sure. Uh, <coughs> in our particular church, and uh, I actually as, as, a, as going to the, uh, the Polish school there, I ended up working with the groundskeeper a lot and got into behind the scenes of how the church is run and, and, and how everything was constructed. And it was it was very superficial. Uh, you, you walked in; it was sort of gave you the impression of a Sistine Chapel, if you will. There was a high, high vaulted ceilings, flying buttress system layout, very large church, all brick, two steeples, giant bells, um, and electronic bells. They played both. And uh, that was the funnest part, by the way, when you were an altar boy, was getting to ring the bells for a funeral, because you had to ring the hammers, which rang the bells. Um, however old the person was that's how many times you had to ring the bell and then at the end you got to pull big bells and you know you could ride the rope up because it was heavy enough to lift you up and so we always had a good time uh, doing funerals uh, as an altar boy because you got 50 cents to do the funeral and then you could ring the bells make a lot of noise <laughs> whereas most of the time you had to go into church and you couldn't say anything you couldn't do anything you couldn't move couldn't talk couldn't speak um, anyway we get into the church and with the big high vaulted ceilings and there was columns you know every so many feet big huge columns turned out they're fake I thought they were real at one time they thought they were marble columns but they're actually fake it's just plaster with painted to look like marble uh, and the reason I found that out is because as we were helping with the groundskeeper and work on the build we had to actually go up in the building and replace you know ropes on the bells and you got to climb up into the ceiling and you found out hey wait a minute you know all these vaulted ceilings what looks like brick up there isn't real <laughs> it's just plaster on wire and then it's painted uh, so when you walked in, there was this huge arch with a with a really large altar where they kept the uh, the chal chalice and the uh, the wafers, and a big altar, Paschal candle, pulpit. A uh, layperson would do the speaking on one, on the other side, and above it was a gigantic cross with Christ hanging on it, uh, crown of thorns, blood, you know, all graphic as it may be, right behind the where the priest stood to the altar. And an altar rail that sort of separated the priest from the people, and then there was a smaller altar to the right as you faced the, the front of the church. And in that altar, in the center, was a picture of the Pope. So it was like he had his own altar to himself on one side, and then to the right of the the center altar was a statue of Mary with, and I forget how many, but it was a certain number of blue lights around her head. And kneeling in front of her with a candle in her hand was uh, from Fatima, the, uh, the little girl. Lucy? Yeah, the little girl was depicted, and it was a statue of her kneeling in front of Mary, praying to Mary. And on the other side was Christ uh, holding his hands up in this fashion, you know, with the marks, and then red lights around his head in, in a halo fashion uh, on the other side. But nobody was praying to him, oddly enough, just to Mary. And an altar to that side that was used during Easter where the bottom half came off and it showed Christ in a tomb and uh, they would take that off during the three days between Friday and, and Sunday and all around the walls along the sides were the stations of the cross carvings <clears throat> on the walls where they would stop at each station and go through the stations of the cross ceremony and then uh, on the ceilings were painted saints. There were images of saints that were painted. And I remember growing up, they redid the painting, and it was, and they were essentially bragging about how the paint itself was gold leaf. It was real gold in the paint, and to paint the ceiling, and it cost forty or fifty thousand dollars to repaint the whole building on the inside. And there was scaffolding you know, all over the place, and it was tough to find a place to sit, and you know that sort of thing. And but. Uh, very ornate, very very statuesque, statues everywhere, um, lots of paintings of saints inscribed on the walls and under the, uh, the Stations of the Cross. You spoke about Easter and mm -hmm. uh, Christ being in the tomb and then 
building up to Easter. Mm-hmm. On glorious Saturday, uh, I remember from being in Warsaw, I saw elderly men carrying little wicker baskets with eggs in them. Mm-hmm. And I asked somebody, well, what are they doing? And they said, they're going off to church to get the Easter eggs blessed by the uh, priest. Mm-hmm. Now, I have seen a lot of Catholicism. I never saw that till I saw it with my own eyes mm-hmm. in Poland. So did you have any of those Easter eggs and yes. men going off to get the Easter eggs blessed? Mm-hmm. It was a, uh, it was a family, family affair. Yeah. Uh, we, it actually came in two flavors. If you could afford to pay the priest to come to your house, he would come to your house and bless the eggs. It was called, uh, hopefully I don't say this incorrectly, but it's Shvensonka. And that's where you would go and have the food blessed. It would it'd be kielbasa and borscht and uh, the red, uh, red beets and uh, horseradish. All the good, it was good Polish food, for sure. Uh, I, I really enjoyed that, the kielbasa and the, the borscht and the hard-boiled eggs. And we'd paint the Easter eggs and we'd do up a very ornate basket and... Uh, as I said, if you could afford it, the priest would come to your house and he would bless your house and those who were in it and you know, bless the food and then you handed him an envelope with money in it. And I remember one year I said, how come the priest isn't coming? My mother said, we can't afford it. He said, we have to go to the church now. And so you'd go to the church and it'd be a mass blessing. You know, there'd be a lot of people there. They'd all have their baskets of food and their baranek, which was, uh, my, my mother came over to this Easter dar house. And we didn't have a Schwenzanka, <laughs> but she built, built a baranek with the kids. It's you take butter and you build a lamb out of butter to symbolize Christ, uh, being the Lamb of God. And they call it bar- baranek, is Polish for lamb. And we would bring all this to the church. It was, it was usually in the basement of the school, actually. And the priest would come down and he'd give the blessing, I'll splash holy water on everybody, and then you'd still give him an envelope. It just didn't have as much money in it for him to do the, uh, the, the blessing of all the food for you. Um, why the eggs? I don't see any mention of eggs in the Bible. You know why? Mm-hmm. Why eggs? And what, what was the symbolism? Did they explain any symbolism or reason for eggs? Uh, when I was um, when I was growing up, it never dawned on me or never explained to me about eggs. However, I think there's as I found out later on, there's a relationship to the in the Ukraine. For example, they have these. There's a special name for it. The name escapes me right now, but the very ornate painted Easter eggs, and it has something to do with that tradition. And if I understand it correctly, it's something to do with the pagan god of fertility the, that deals with the eggs. Is where that comes from, and that's how the, the Easter Bunny and the Americanized version of Easter with the Easter eggs and the Easter Bunny has some relationship to that, although I don't know the the full history of it. We were never told that. We were just told you went and had the things blessed by the priest. So this was part of the Easter celebrations. Mm-hmm. Uh, now to come back, uh, your life as an altar boy, you went on to be confirmed. Mm-hmm. What was confirmation like? And how was it explained to you? Uh, I was explained that in eighth grade is when this happened. It was the last year I was in school there. But in confirmation, you took on the name of a saint. And it's kind of funny, the names that we picked. But uh, there was side note. When uh, my mother tried to get me to take Albert because my grandfather's name was Albert. And she wanted it to be associated with him. And I wanted Luke. And she said, why do you want Luke? I like Luke. Well, it turns out the friend of mine in, in school, we watched the Dukes of Hazards. And it was Bo and Luke Duke uh, of Hazards. And, and he was a blonde guy, and I was, you know, well, when I had hair, you know, I had dark hair, and, and so I was Luke, and he was Bo. And so uh, he tried to come up with a name, uh, a saint that was named Bo, so he could be Bo and I could be Luke, and we had it, you know, officially somehow. But uh, that was the name I had chosen was Luke. Uh, for that reason, it had nothing to do with picking a saint. <laughs> when it, you know, I just never told my mother because I knew it would upset her. But um, uh, we were just told that you had to confirm your baptism, which you know later on, once again, I find out that well, how does that make any sense? You know, because you're baptized as an infant, you can't speak for yourself, so you need a godparent to speak for you, and then later on, you have to confirm that you're okay with that. So what did you do for the years between you were an infant to your eighth, eight years old? You were just relying on somebody else's word 
for did your, you, did your you have any instruction that they prepare you? Had you any examination to do before you were ready to be confirmed? The only thing that I remember that we were instructed to understand was if you go through this ceremony, you take a name and you get confirmed with oil, that you are dedicating your life to being Catholic the rest of your life. And that was, that was the confirmation. Are you sure you're a Catholic? If you're not sure about this, don't go through confirmation. But if you're sure you're going to be a Catholic and you dedicate your life from here on out, then go through confirmation. That's the only thing I remember being taught. Other than following the proper procedures, you come in in a procession, you sit down, you kneel, you stand, and all the, the proper times to stand up and... Well, how the different oils. was the bishop? This was a bishop doing mm -hmm. the ceremony and not a, an ordinary priest. And how did he look to you? <laughs> you know, how did he make his entrance and his exit? And oh. what was your impression, you know, eighth grade of being, encountering the bishop? Was it a bishop for the first time you were meeting a bishop for yes. the first time? It's the first time I was meeting a bishop and I didn't want to meet him. And the reason I didn't want to meet him is because I was told we had to kiss his ring. And I said, there's no way I'm going to bend down and kiss some guy's ring who's wearing a dress and a pointy hat and a hook. I said, this just, I don't get this. So I made an excuse to my mother. I said, my hands are rough. I was playing out in the dirt, and I really, I can't shake his hand to kiss his hand because my hand will stick to his gloves because he wore white, white gloves, big costume, and the staff with the hook on it and a pointy hat. And, and, you were, and a couple guys in front of me did kiss his ring, and I didn't kiss his ring. I said, how you doing? And I shook his hand. I walked away. I said, I wasn't going to kiss the guy's ring. That just didn't seem right to me. But uh, it was a big, big deal when the bishop came to town. You know, everybody, oh my goodness, the bishop's here. And they all raised the, you know, clean the place up, make sure it was, you know, all fancy. And, and I remember, I remember when I was getting married, I, in, uh, I was told I couldn't have the wedding outside. I had to get permission from the bishop. And so I made a joke to my cousin, who was the priest who did the, the wedding ceremony, I said, wow, you think maybe if I send him a bottle of wine or something, you know, he could get his okay on this letterhead? He says, Tony, come on. He says, we're talking about a bishop here. And I thought, oh, I offended you. You know, send him a bottle of wine. He goes, you should send him a case of wine. Wow. And I said, oh, well, okay then. <laughs> I guess I didn't offend you. <laughs> <laughs> who was it said that to you? Who was it? Uh, my my cousin, the Catholic priest. Oh, the Catholic priest. Oh, yes. Yeah, the, yeah. the cousin who he performed the ceremony because he yeah, had to get permission yeah. yes, yes, to perform yes, the ceremony yeah. in that jurisdiction of the we bishop. We used to, we as there. priests, uh, every Christmas we got actually cases and it wasn't wine, it was rum. You know, oh, really? We got uh, sometimes one or two cases of rum. And it was expected that you would, uh, mm -hmm. that the people would honor you by giving you a case of mm -hmm. rum, you know, and uh, even the the manufacturers of the rum were supposed to send a case of okay. rum. So it was, uh, it was, um, well, that was Trinidad West Indies, and when we were talking about you mm -hmm. in a Polish setting. So um, now you have left uh, school altogether, is it? High school? You have you yeah, I went to, uh, went to high school. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you graduate into? What did you? What way were you qualified? Were you oh, I went from eighth grade to in the Catholic school to ninth grade in public school. Okay. Public high school. And when you finished high school, where did you go? What? What? what where? Did, what was the rest of you? I I went to uh, Utica College, uh, in Utica, New York. Uh, got a bachelor's degree in computer science. Okay. And then uh, went on from there to work at uh, what was called Rome, Rome Air Development Center at the time at Griffiths Air Force Base. It's a research lab. And continued on. My education got a master's degree in computer engineering and then a, uh, another master's degree in economic crime management. And still work at the Air Force lab, at the research lab. In Rome, upstate New York. In Rome, New York, yeah. yes. Where we are at the moment. Okay, now you have a job, and uh, you think you're getting married. This mm -hmm. is your, you, you mentioned sometime when you're going to get married, so, mm -hmm. uh, and you wanted to have a Catholic wedding, but you didn't want to mm -hmm. be in a church. So, uh, what happened? Uh, did you have to go to the priest? Had you any prenuptial requirements to make? Yeah. And what were the regulations? When I had met this 
this man, uh, his name is Scott Hughes. We, we were talking about him earlier. He wrote a book on the collapse of evolution. And it turns out he he had gone to some uh, seminary. Uh, I don't remember the, the details of which. And I was thinking of having him perform the wedding ceremony because I got to know him quite well. And he's the one who was talking to me about creation versus evolution and telling me about being a born-again believer at the time. right? And uh, So I was thinking about having him perform the ceremony. And my mother went through the roof. Oh, she couldn't. She would not have it. And she made a, a, a big deal about how our cousin, the, the, my cousin, the Catholic priest, needed to perform the ceremony. I didn't really want it. My wife uh, at the time um, was still my wife today. <laughs> Back then when she wasn't my wife, uh, said that, you know, I guess it would be fine with her. You know, after a while she warmed up to it. And I said, fine, if my mother will be happy with it, you know, I'd like to, you know, please my parents. So uh, I, I had a conversation with him and he said, well, there's a few things you have to do. He said, you need to go to pre-Cana classes. You need to sit down and talk to a priest. It's, she, he said it would help if you were a member of a, a Catholic church in your area. By this time, going through college, I was living the college life and not particularly interested in going to church and didn't go to church while I was in college unless I was home and my mother said, you should go to church, you know, come with me. And I would accompany her. But uh, at, that, at that particular time, I just found a local church in Rome. Uh, I think it was St. Peter's. Father Hearn was, was the guy's name, the priest. And I, I went to talk to him, and he said it would be okay if to, to do pre-Cana classes. So they sent us off for a couple of days to this pre-Cana class, and they told us about how um, finances are a big problem in marriages, and that is, leads to divorce, and how and they had a couple people come up there and talk how one was a Catholic and one was Jewish, and they actually got married, so they were unequally yoked, if you will, from that, their perspective and how that was okay and you could make it work and how religions can work together and then that's what we were told in, in pre-Cana. And then we sat down with Father Hearn and had to have some face time with him and some one-on-one -on -one interviews with him and get his okay that, that, that we're cleared. And I remember distinctly one of the things we had to sign was a, a piece of paper that said, I hereby swear to raise my children in the Catholic faith. If we have children, to raise them in the Catholic faith. And I looked at that and I said, I don't know about this. I said, number one, I'm not going to Catholic Church right now. I said, the only reason I'm sitting here talking to you is because in order to have my cousin, who my mother wants to marry us, do the ceremony, you have to sign a piece of paper that says I did this. And then he's got to get permission from a bishop to do the, ser the perform the ceremony. And I said, so I'm not sure I want to sign this. And uh, I had to sign one and my wife had to, well, my wife now, had to, had to sign one then as well. And she wasn't Catholic. She wasn't raised Catholic. She wanted nothing to do with Catholic. She said, I'm not signing it. And he told us, that would be okay. You can sign for her. And I said, how can I sign a document that she's supposed to be legally bound to according to the Catholic Church? And we started discussing it. And my wife kicked me under the table when he wasn't looking. And she said, just shine, sign it. Shut up so we can get out of here. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so I signed both documents. And then the, uh, the, the, the big problem of, uh, I wanted my wedding outside. You know, for the most part, I said to my wife, Honey, this is a girl's day. Wedding is a girl's day. You have whatever you want, just tell me when to show up and what to wear. And then that's all I need to know. Outside of that, the only thing I want is a clam bake and have it outside. <laughs> Her mother said, If I'm paying for it, you're not having a clam bake, and okay, I'll let you have it outside. So <laughs> it's all right. Uh, so... That turned out to be another issue with the Catholic Church that we had to have the ceremony in the church. And I just didn't understand that. And we started discussing uh, that issue. And once again, my wife kicked me under the table and said, shut up and let him sign the document so we can get out of here. And so I did, and I didn't say anything more. And, but it was a continual pattern as I was brought up from you know, in, in the Catholic school, being taught by the nuns and follow the direction, do what I tell you. And, and all the ceremonial rites and rituals that had that went on in, in school. I mean, we even had one case that drove me absolutely insane, and I didn't understand why it was. But here we are in a Catholic school, and around Christmas time, all the classes would line up in the hallway, and one of the nuns would hold a plastic statue of 
we were told baby Jesus and you were supposed to go up and kiss that statue on the leg and then she had an alcohol wipe and she'd wipe it off and the next person was supposed to kiss it and the next person was supposed to kiss it. And I said, why are we kissing a plastic statue? This doesn't make any sense to me. Be quiet and do what you're told. Okay, I'll do what I'm told. I walk up, I kiss this plastic statue. No idea why. Doesn't make any sense to me. But this was one of the rituals that they did in the church. Um, and speaking of kissing statues, we had uh, two, two times. Um, I remember being told that... Uh, Every Catholic church had a piece of the crucifix, the actual cross that Christ uh, was hung on. And I said, well, first of all, where did you get it? And we were told that they dug up the Mount of Skulls there, right, in Golgotha and looked for archaeological digs and looked for crosses. And they, it was a common thing to crucify people back then, right? So there was a lot of crosses. So I said, how did you find the one that was Christ? And they, they took a quadriplegic out of a wheelchair and laid the person on the cross and the person was miraculously healed. And they said, this must be Christ's cross. So they took a little tiny sliver and put it in two slivers, put it in the shape of a cross and it's in this big ornate gold-plated velvet with tassels hanging off it and spikes on the top um, glass case. And you would line up in church to kiss that piece of cross. And I said, why am I kissing a hunk of wood? <laughs> you know, I don't get this. Will somebody please explain this to me? And I was never explained anything. And I don't know, maybe being a scientist and an engineer, I had to have answers. And I was not given an answer. I was just told, shut up in color, go in the corner, do what you're told. And I just didn't accept that. I remember the same thing from Ireland, uh, all the relics we had, the bones yes. of saints. And when I was a young man uh, in the Jesuit college, they brought the arm of St. Francis Saviour. Mm -hmm. And uh, the arm was passed around from different pew to pew. You know, there was in a big glass case mm -hmm. so we could see the arm that had baptized thousands of babies, you know, that mm -hmm. is, as he went as a missionary. And... Um, I was a bit horrified that this was long time dead. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was being passed yeah. around and we were supposed to some veneration or honor for this great uh, Jesuit saint. And uh, I can understand being mystified mm -hmm. because I was trained to, you're not supposed to ask questions. And right. seemingly you were asking questions and it comes to asking questions particularly about uh, evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if I'm jumping ahead of you because sure. I remember as a priest being trained with uh, about uh, Pius XII spoke about um, evolution taking place under the power of God mm -hmm. but through um, man coming from lower type of animals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. up to being apes and then uh, eventually becoming human but it was theistic evolution mm -hmm. because God was in charge and yes they held for creation in this way that it was extended over millions and millions of years of right. time and they called it theistic mm -hmm. uh, so that um, evolution yes but theistic it was God Powered uh, of evolution. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the exact words. I'm, I'm, I don't have the exact words in front of me. But the general impact of what I learned from uh, the Pope, there was the Pope after the war, who had greatly influenced me. You know, mm -hmm. by his aestheticism, his aesthetic look, and everything. I didn't realize that he was the same one who made uh, concordats with Hitler and Mussolini. Mm -hmm. He was a uh, not such a saintly man after all, but that's another story. But uh, this then idea, was that run by you that uh, God had used evolution, you know, that um, things really came from the slime of the earth and there was different, <coughs> different ways in which uh, things evolved over the course of millions and millions and millions of years. Was that filled into you or how was yes, it? Yes and no. Um, there was... We were taught in our science classes in the Catholic Church about evolution, evolutionary processes, Darwinism, various things associated with evolution. We were also told that Adam and Eve were the first people.
but there was never a link between the two. And I remember distinctly asking my mother once again, because she was the primary mover with regards to Catholicism. My father, although claiming to be Catholic, I you know rarely went to church. Uh, once in a while on Christmas he'd go, but most of the time he just didn't. Uh, and I'd asked her, I said, well, Ma, you know, they're teaching us this stuff in school, but I thought Adam and Eve were the first created of God. And she was the one who, who gave me something to that effect. She, she couldn't explain it. She just said, well, the, the apes became Adam and Eve and they were the first people. So they were still the first people, still the first created of God, but there was this whole evolution thing that happened. And that was about the extent of what I was told. And I said, huh, I seems once again I questioned and said that doesn't seem right it doesn't quite add up but okay if that's what you're telling me I'll I'll listen to you and you know you're my mom I'll accept what you tell me as truth and you know that was it but we were never never really taught creation at all that that was the the fundamental point of of God wanting uh to create uh, mankind or the universe or anything seen or unseen was his but that well, here's science, and here's some evolution, here's biology, and that, but never really taught creation. So, how come then did you began to question and say, no, it's not all right? Mm -hmm. uh, how did that transition take place? I remember in fifth grade, um, there was a new priest that came to the, the church, replaced one of the other ones who went on to become, the pa I guess, the pastor, the, the head parish priest at a different church to have a job opportunity. And uh, the, the new guy was, was teaching class and just didn't seem right and didn't really get along with too many kids. As, as far as I remember, nobody really liked him, if you will. But I, I ended up getting an F in religion. <laughs> it was uh, the first F I ever got, and I was kind of thrown back. I was like, wow, I got an F. Why did I get an F? You know, and Apparently because I just didn't shut up in color. I asked questions. I disagreed with the priest. I didn't take what he said uh, straight away as truth. And that, that's where it all started. And after that, I just, you know, being reprimanded quite harshly by my, my parents <laughs> for getting an F on my report card. And not to mention getting an F in religion. I was an altar boy. How can you get an F in religion? They're telling me. Don't you learn? You know, haven't we taught you right? Haven't we brought you up properly to teach you what Catholicism is? And... I don't know, it just it never got any better from there either. You know, I, I learned to shut up in color and answer the, the answers the way they wanted to hear them, and not question anybody, and never raise anything. And then when I got out of when I got out of school, you know, went off to college, I was on my own. I sort of said, eh, you know, why bother with this Catholicism? It's just a bunch of nonsense anyway. Never really thought much of it. Sort of never went to church anymore. Only went like I said when my mother wanted me to go, and it was. Gee, when is communion so we can leave at communion and get and get out before the mad rush? You know, because there was always that time period after communion where they had the final prayer and the benediction, I guess, and people could go and you know people would get communion and hightail it out the door to be out of there. And uh, that was you know, the only times we went. But then I ran into a guy at work. His name was Scott Hughes, who wrote a book on the collapse of evolution. And then I started to challenge him on his position on creation versus evolution. Now, I, I wasn't, didn't really care a whole lot about evolution, but it was fun to play devil's advocate and try to get him riled up and get him going because we were, we were quite good colleagues at work and, and friends as far as that went. And it turned out he, he gave me his testimony, which I, had never, I didn't know what the testimony was anyway at that time, but uh, he explained it to me and said that uh, he was part of the National uh, Geologic Survey and he worked as a geologist. He had a degree in geology. And he was doing his surveys, and, and he had this woman helping him who eventually became his wife, who was a born-again Christian. And he would rant and rave and, and talk about how great evolution was and Darwinism and look at all of this wonderful stuff that evolved. And, and she would sort of giggle and, and sneer at him, and, and he, want, he sort of liked her. So he wanted to find out why she's laughing at him. And then she explained to him creation and the God of the universe that he needed to know. And... Uh, he said, well, I'm going, to sh I'm going to prove you wrong, and that way you'll see how much greater I am, you know, and you'll like me even more. It's, this is he, he explained it to me this way. And he, uh, he set out to disprove creation and disprove the Bible. And after studying it, reading it, and trying to disprove it, he ended up wholeheartedly believing it. <laughs> and, uh, That's happened to many saying, others. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, at that point, he wrote the book. 
and uh, his wife co uh, collaborated with him on it. She did the artwork in it and whatnot. And uh, I mean, he, he would discuss it with me, and I'd challenge him and say, "Well, what about this?" And he'd come, he'd have an answer, you know. And so, I guess different from him versus the priest, he at least had an answer, and he had an answer out of the Bible. He'd say, "Well, God said this, you know. God said that, and God did this." And whereas I'd ask the priest, and he'd say, "Because I said so." And that, because I said so isn't an answer, you know. I mean, talking to your three-year-old and they don't understand, that's one thing. But, you know, to somebody who's asking a legitimate question of something you're supposedly teaching, give me an answer. And so I got answers from him from the Bible. Now, the key point, uh, Tony, how come then that you uh, get right with God and that mm -hmm. you become... You know, born again Christian. Did anybody ever use the word born again, or that you needed to be born again, or you needed to be have a personal relationship with Christ? Did anybody ever, you know, uh, challenge you and tell you that uh, you know mm -hmm. religion doesn't save? It's mm -hmm. a, a personal relationship with Christ. And uh, mm -hmm. did anybody come to you like that? They did not as someone door knocking, not as someone handing me a track. I was never handed a track. Uh, mainly talking with Scott and some people who I know today are not saved but they knew or had heard the salvation message and it would come up and they would tell me with the salvation message and they're not even saved I'm thinking wow this is, this is really interesting I've never heard this before I never heard it in the Catholic Church all I heard was do what the priest tells you and I said wow there's something to this number one I'm getting answers on creation. I'm getting answers on evolution. And I'm getting them from the Bible. And I have these people telling me this stuff. I think, this is good. I'm getting answers. I like to have answers, you know? And so as I was getting those answers, I said, well, there must be more answers, you know, in God's Word. And I uh, began to read the Bible myself. I pick up the Bible and read it. And one thing that cued me on that, too, was going to my wife's uh, grandmother's funeral, which she was Baptist. And, you know, I didn't know anything about Baptist. I don't know anything about anything. But I remember sitting there thinking, wow, everybody's happy. There isn't people crying. There isn't all this. You know, we went to the church. It was a, a building. You know, it was, it was an old brick church with a steeple, but there was no paintings. There was no statues. There wasn't a lot of ornateness. It was a bunch of pews and a pulpit. So people could come and hear the Word of God. And... I said, wow, this is, there must be something to this Baptist thing because you know they're reading from the Bible. I got answers from the Bible before. And Scott's telling me answers from the Bible. and I can't refute them. I've tried. And the Bible seems correct every time I try to refute it. So I, I, can't, I can't question this. I said, there must be more. And I thought my wife was actually saved. When I finally understood it a little more, and as I said, no one ever handed me a track. I, I did, was doing this all on my own just by reading the Word of God. I just sat down I read the Word of God. And it was her Bible because I never had one. Never had a Bible my whole life. She had a Bible. This is your wife? My Bible. wife, yeah. She had a Bible. And she wasn't saved, but she actually had a Bible. So I said, well, do you have a Bible? And she said, yeah, I do. And I said, well, let me see that thing. Where were you reading? Can you remember what part of the Bible you were reading? I started in Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to see, what is this creation all about? And I read yeah, through yeah. Genesis and uh, in the beginning through Exodus. God. Yes. That's right. Yes. And you couldn't, couldn't go wrong there. And I thought she was ahead of me. I said, wow, I better catch up to my wife. She knows all about this stuff and, and mm -hmm. she must be saved. And you know, I didn't know anything about asking her for her testimony or anything of those. Uh, well, uh, you see also. clearly from Genesis that Adam and Eve sinned. Absolutely. And then, of course, Paul explains that all have sinned in Adam. Mm -hmm. And we are all mm -hmm. born sinners with, mm -hmm. a, with a bad nature, mm -hmm. bad heart, and then... Uh, Paul says, all of sin become short of the glory of God. Now, did you realize one day that you really were a sinner and that you needed a Savior? Mm -hmm. Definitely. I definitely knew that what, it, this my thinking at the time, that uh, there has to be a creator, number one. And the story in Genesis makes sense. There's reason behind. There is a reason for creation. There is a reason for all the things that are in Genesis, and and I understood that. And I said, okay, well, there has to be a creator. I said, this creator must be God. There, there can't be more than one. There has only be one. Because otherwise, if there was more than one, then everybody's religion 
it would be okay. And you were sort of told that, it, well, you accept whoever it is, and, but you're also told if you're not Catholic, you're going to hell. It had nothing to do with being saved, nothing to do with understanding Christ's uh, sacrifice on Calvary and His blood covering of your sin and your wickedness. Uh, never that was explained ever as a Catholic. And sort of coming across that and understanding that over time, as I read God's Word, I came to that realization that, wow, I'm a sinner. That this is, I sin all the time. I sin and I don't even know I've sinned. You know, and that's when you know the light comes on, and you know, there's the Holy Spirit convicting you of your sin one after another. Like, oh, I did that again. Oh, I did this, and you know, all these things start coming back to you all the time. Oh, I can't believe I did. You know, you read some of God's word, and you're convicted about something, and you go, "I'm guilty of that too," and you're guilty of everything. And uh, after I had gotten saved, and I, I remember saying the sinner's prayer to myself. I was alone. I had nobody witness. I said nobody witnessing to me. I, I did it myself. And in fact, I did it several times because I didn't know if I was doing it right. I said, I don't, is there a way you know, being brought up in the Catholic tradition and the Catholic dogma of there is a procedure and a process to do everything. Um, you know, wear the right, I probably didn't have the right clothes on is what I was thinking too. Maybe I'm supposed to wear a gown. I don't know. You know? Uh, but I remember doing that several times. Okay, and then after a while I saying, well, I must have done it right because, man, I don't like the way the world looks. And after that, it, every single thing was driving me nuts about the world. That this person said this, this person has taken the Lord's name in vain. I mean, immediately after that, I never took the Lord's name in vain again. It just stopped. And I remember my wife telling me, and this was sort of scary because we were newly married not that long, and we just uh, had a son, and it was another reason to, to start going to church. I said, gee, we really ought to bring him up in the faith and admonition of the Lord. And, uh, and she said, oh, okay, whatever. But... She came to me and said, "You're different." She specific. She pointed at me. She said, "You're different." One month. I'm sorry. One year. Four months. Three days. You're different, and this is going to be a problem in our marriage. <laughs> like, wow, you know. And we had a big conversation that night, uh, and I told her, I said, "You're a sinner," and she said, "No one ever told her that she was a sinner before," and I said, "You, you know, you sin every day." It, I'm a good person. I said, you can be a good person, but you're still a sinner. Because you know, a good person is a measurement that the world puts on you, not God. I mean, compare yourself to the righteousness of Christ and you fail miserably. You know, And we had that, and that went on for a while, and it was a point of strife and contention. I remember reading Second Corinthians thinking, i got to stick this out according to what the Bible says. You know, And if she leaves me, well, then that would be okay if she left, but I can't leave. And you know, I kept reading that going, oh no. I was thinking, I hope she doesn't leave me. And... I hope, you know, maybe she'll get saved, and then I kept just trusting God's word, trusting in God's word. Be still and know that I am God. You know, I kept remembering that. Be still and know that I am God, and then uh, uh, that you and your house would be saved. Would yeah. be saved. And, yes. and I just kept, I just kept concentrating on that, and then and, and praying about her, and praying about her, and then we we came to this church, Friendship Baptist Church, and she got under the preaching and teaching the word of God, and I was working really hard, and I, I didn't tell. I think I told one person this, but uh, as far as uh, my walk and making sure that I didn't screw up and I was really concentrating on that and praying that God would lead me and, and make sure I don't do things wrong in front of her and had a good testimony and so she would understand and try to, I tried to get her to read the Bible with me and, and things and it was, as I said, a real rough point of contention. We had many of argument or a crying time and well, we both end up crying at the end of it and, and uh, finally I said, well... What's this prayer and fasting thing? You know, it's just coming across that a little bit. Said, okay, well, I'm going to fast for you know that my wife gets saved. Right after that is when she got saved, and uh, right after she heard a particular message at church, and I finally said, "Enough is enough." The Lord is telling me I got to get baptized, whether she's going to accept it or not. I'm going to do it, and it was it was a great day. Our house is just absolutely fantastic. Praise God. Amen. Now, earlier on, you talked about being convicted that you were a sinner. Mm -hmm. uh, did you see then that Christ's blood had taken away your sin and that uh, you were standing before the old holy God in the righteousness of Christ? Or was anything of like that in your mind? Or? It was, at the time, once again, this was like nine years ago, uh, at the time, it was more of a, this is what the Bible said, the Bible is truth. I need to accept that. I may not fully understand it right now, and I'm going to keep trying to learn and, and make sure I understand it clearer, but that's what it says, and I accept it. 
you accepted that Christ was the only one yes. that could yeah. take away your sins and there was yeah. only his righteousness that mm -hmm. in, in where we can stand. And I, say, I, didn't, I didn't fully understand any of this because I had nobody to talk to. I was by myself. I didn't have a church at the time. I was just reading the Bible and it was uh, an NASV version of the Bible which was a little watered down and, yeah. and it wasn't a study Bible. It didn't have extra helps in it. So I'm just trying to be led by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would bring things to my attention. You know, what about this? What about that? And yeah. So, now you really love the Lord and love to serve Him and uh, give witness to your faith. And I know how keen you were to speak to people about your Polish background mm -hmm. and, and how that, you know, you desire to see other precious Catholic people uh, realize the pomp and the religiosity mm -hmm. and that uh, it really doesn't add up to anything. It's uh, oh, dirty rags. Yeah, but it is. Uh, it can pull on us because of the family uh, ties and background. But at the end of the day, we've got to obey God Absolutely. and not man, and we've got Absolutely. to look out to God to save us utterly. Absolutely. Yeah. You speak about, uh, you mentioned Second Corinthians, uh, but uh, Second Corinthians always comes to my mind uh, when I think of salvation and mm -hmm. what you said to us today. At the end of chapter 5 of Second Corinthians, uh, the Apostle Paul says, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that mm -hmm. we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And I think that's a, a good summary and note to finish on, that... He who knew no sin That's right. became sin for Tony and for Richard. Mm -hmm. Because he was pure and absolutely perfect. And he legally became sin. Why? So we might become the righteousness of God in him. Mm -hmm. So that Tony and Richard could stand before the all-holy God mm -hmm. in the righteousness of Christ. And that's finally your testimony, Tony, that... We are speaking to the glory of God that Amen. was Christ of Savior. Right. And we were just the uttermost. Yeah, we were just sinners and destitute of all hope. And so for you, listener, it is important that you look to Christ and that you trust that that Savior can be your Savior and you can have the same joy unspeakable and the desire to share as Tony had today, to share testimony so that God could be glorified right. and that we could have a, a, a peace with God Amen. in our reasonable faith. You know, you were a computer scientist and you know, from Polish background, but mm -hmm. peace with God because you have a reasonable faith because you know the scripture is true and the scripture tells us That's that right. we are sinners and we trust that the sin problem is dealt with in Christ. That's right. And may God be glorified. Tony, it has been wonderful sharing you. with you. And may your testimony go forth in the message of Christ Jesus to the glory of his name. Amen. 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 Thank you.